Brilliant. Okay, so let's uh, let's kick this off then. So, hi everyone, and thank you very much for joining us this evening for what promises to be a great panel discussion on a topic very close to my heart called being a BAME leader. And BAME is a recognized acronym that encompasses people from the Black, Asian, and minority ethnic communities. My name is Dr. Abbas Tajani, and I'm a GP and occupational physician based in Leicester. I wear a number of educational hats, including being chair of the City Academy at the Leicester Medical School, as well as being the first five chair for the Royal College of GPs in Leicestershire. Now, we'd like to make this session as interactive as possible, so feel free to put your questions to us in the Q&A section below. And if we don't manage to answer your question in the session, then we'll certainly try and cover the others uh, in a blog afterwards. Um, I'd like to start off by introducing our panel, but before I do that, I just want to extend my utmost thanks to both Antoinette Hoyt and Kimberly Howe for their brilliant work in helping facilitate this event. So thank you both for, for your help. Um, turning to our panel tonight, we've, we have an amazing, uh, talented lineup of GPs who've really excelled in their leadership roles. And they'll be telling you a bit about their background, how they entered into their leadership roles, the, the challenges they faced and how they overcame them. Uh, and then they'll be taking your questions. So feel free to ask any questions that um, you can think of. And we've already got a list of questions that have been asked in advance of tonight's uh, meeting. Um, they were chosen specifically because their leadership roles are so varied and I'm sure they'll be sharing real gems of wisdom. Um, so firstly, we have Professor Mayor Lakani, Chair of the West Leicestershire CCG and immediate past president of the Royal College. We have Dr. Shahid Murali, who's a clinical senior lecturer and lead for primary education at the Aston Medical School. We also have Dr. Victoria Tsotsiu Brown, uh, former chair of the Royal College of GPs, who will be joining us, oh, she's already joined us. Um, and uh, so she is the uh, former chair of the Royal College of GPs and current honorary secretary. And you've also got my daughter here, who's also uh, shaking my arm, uh, making a special guest appearance. Um, we also have Dr. Nikita Kanani, who will be joining us just a little bit after seven, who's the medical director for primary care for NHS England. We have Dr. Olugbenga Ogumbadejo, who's the founder and president of Nigerian GPs UK, and Dr. Margaret Ikpo, who's associate director of primary care education at Hull York Medical School. Now, they all do lots and lots of other things apart from what I've just outlined, and I'm sure they'll be sharing that with you, but that's just a brief summary. Um, so thank you all very much, my panel, for joining us. And I wanted to add at this point that if anyone is interested in being part of the First Five or BAME Network, either locally or nationally, please get in touch with us um, at www.rcgp.org.uk. Um, our colleagues across the UK are an invaluable support system, and you'll probably hear a bit about our work throughout this session. Hello. <laughs> you okay? Yeah. Um, so on to the event. I wonder um, if each of you will tell us a bit about your journey into general practice and into your leadership role. So our respected Professor Mayo, I want to start with you. So please, could you kick us off? Thank you. Well, good evening, colleagues, and thank you for inviting me to be on this um, webinar. Um, if I can share my screen just to share my reflections on the very important topic today. Um, can I just check first of all that you, you are, you can see it. Can you see my screen? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, um, I want to start with the story of who am I, because this was one of the things that Abbas uh, invited us to think about. So this makes us think about identity and who we are. So these are flags of countries. So I was born in Uganda, which is a flag on, on my top right corner in East Africa. I'm of Indian heritage. Uh, I came as a refugee to Great Britain in 1972, and I went to university in Scotland. So what is my identity? But I'm proud of all my roots and origins. And actually this is a really favorite picture of mine and my family's which shows me in the college tartan. So all the people listening in and viewing it tonight should know that we have a very strong college in Scotland. And actually that is the college tartan there which was shown in the previous slide as well. And on this night I had um, uh, an Indian made pen on my uh, in my jacket I had uh, English clothing I had Scottish trousers and gosh knows what else so this is who I am and my leadership journey 
My past is that I was chair of the college, then president, and I was chair of the National Council of Palliative Care. Currently, I'm chair of the Faculty of Medical Leadership and Management, and also chair the West CCG in Leicestershire, and I'm a system clinical lead. I'm always, I have been, and I'll say a bit more, I'm a practicing GP as well. You've asked me to talk about the future. Now that's really difficult to do, but uh, somebody else did ask me that, and this came up instinctively, that I want to continue to learn and to be a better clinical doctor. Therefore, I'm working on the front line in the COVID-19 service. So I'll be on a shift this evening uh, and in some other work related to that but I still feel I have one or two more big roles in me. Can I say this is not like a request for offers or anything or, or, uh, or an advert for me. It's just to, to think about, you know, creating the space and energy and planning your career and leadership journey. So how did I get involved? My first foray into leadership was through the local faculty, which I would strongly recommend. I was a newsletter editor. I was a faculty chair, a council member. I've been nationally elected five times. Uh, I was father of the council, although I feel I'm very young still. I was father of council until 2019. And I'm told that one of 10 GPs to be chair and president. And my roles have generally been through election. That might be an interesting thing we should maybe discuss. Although for the charity sector, I was approached an interview for the role. So, you know, a lot of people say to me, did you have a plan? Is this what you wanted to do? No, it was totally by accident. I went to a faculty uh, meeting one evening. Uh, there was a request for somebody to attend council because the council member usually went, couldn't go. So I went along and I got involved in the work uh, of the college. You know, if you ask people who knew me at medical school, and even when I look back on my medical school days, we'll have our 40 year reunion very soon. You know, I had no strategy or plan. Nobody would have predicted that, oh, Dr. Lakani is going to be president and chair of the college. And you'll hear that story a lot. Um, so is it luck? How does it happen? But one thing I'd like to commend is a structure to your career. So I call it the SEARL portfolio, SEARL. This is actually used in Singapore as well, where you have clinical, education, research, and leadership. And the fit of roles is very, very important. So I think uh, something I asked myself for this presentation was, why did I want to be a leader? What's the meaning? Now, this is very particular to me. You'll have to identify your own meaning. But for me, my, my hinterland was as a working GP. And in my family, you know, I have stories of poor care, of late diagnosis of cancer. When I knew what the standard should be, I'm sorry, I know that sounds a bit trite and um, like things you'd expect people to say, but I really believe very passionately that that was wrong, that we shouldn't overlook poor standards. You know, and I was struck as a junior doctor in 1983, why was there such a variation in care? Some people were admitted to hospital, others with similar conditions were discharged. Why were some wards having a better outcome than others? And when we had difficult cases, along came brilliant doctors and leaders that we looked up to who pronounced and gave us a way forward. So I've been passionate about the best clinical care but I would say that, you know, it took me five years to get solid clinical experience after my MRC GP. So it's a question here for the seminar. When is the best time to take on significant roles? The timing of leadership journeys. I must say I'm sometimes concerned when people in the very early stages take on substantial roles and the clinical commitment is very small. Now, I'm not saying that's the wrong thing to do, but I think uh, for me, that wouldn't have worked particularly well. So for me, my practice was my anchor. Throughout my career, I've been in the same practice, it'll be 30 years next year. And as a base, I had multiple roles, but they were consistent. So talking points for this event. 
attitudes and mindsets are really important. Yeah, you have choices. Um, I was advised very early on choose between the political trade union route BMA or standards and be on the side of patients. The college is a membership organization, but you know it's made his name because it's on the side of patients. Um, and also be careful, you know, medical leadership is a syndrome, you know, it never goes away, it's persistent, it takes you over. After one role, you want to go on to another role, and then another role. Sadly, I have seen many people who have come to harm because of this. They've lost their marriage, their families, their practices, and that's not a good place to be in, right? So you have choices to make. Uh, talk with your family, your practice is absolutely crucial. You know, you might commit to two sessions or three sessions a week, but it's always going to be more than that, isn't it? We all know that, yeah? These are key things. And also, though, when you made a choice, so I made a choice, uh, I talked to my family extensively before I stood for the presidency as to what it would mean. Stick to that choice, yeah? You, you made a choice. It involves an unlimited commitment. You have to fulfill that. There's no point complaining about it afterwards. So therefore, I want to talk about entitlement cynicism. I have seen that, unfortunately. I know these are strong phrases. But to be a successful person and leader, you have to guard against entitlement and cynicism. I've talked about the timing of leadership journey. And also you need a supportive network, but essentially for national roles, you're on your own. It's lonely at the top. You have to make decisions, but it's okay to have ambition. You know, we want people with ambition. So just coming towards the issue of the day, which is the BAME issue. Now, I genuinely mean this in my first statement, and I don't mean this to sound trite or, um, not to acknowledge the real distress people feel or about racism and discrimination. But I never felt that my ethnicity would be a barrier to progress. Just like many women feel that gender will not be a barrier to access. But I do know that both women and BAME doctors experience structural racism and discrimination. And this was brought home to me in the South Asian doctors exhibition I did for the college that I led on which you know, is a horror story of the experience of South Asian doctors. And similarly, when I met with black GPs uh, from Britain in the President's Listening Exercise last year, uh, I learned huge amounts about the plight of black doctors in Great Britain, uh, the difficulties they face, the enormous contribution they make, yet it's not recognized. So I would say that, you know, a better term is needed than BAME because it assumes everybody is the same. We're not the same. So just in conclusion, therefore, I think in terms of BAME issues, you know, we have to have evidence-based policy. There's a lot of rhetoric and uh, statements, but we have to look to the future because we have more in common than we think. And I highlight two websites here where real research is being done on issues of identity and race, on integration, immigration, togetherness, and being citizens of, of this country. So um, I'm going to have two last, this is my penultimate slide. I recognize that a lot of racism is has been exposed by the COVID-19 pandemic, particularly in areas where I work, like Leicestershire, you know? And we need a huge effort to build togetherness. But you know, I ask you this question, which is the best country in the world to be a BAME doctor and a leader? I would put it to you that Britain is right amongst the top, if not the top country, you know? So we should aim high and focus on clinical and leadership excellence. So in summary, the case for change and medical leadership is very strong. Leadership from doctors works, there's an evidence base for it. Everyone can be a leader. The role of a doctor is to be a clinician, to partner with patients and coworkers, and to be a leader. There are now more opportunities than ever before, but guard against entitlement and cynicism. My top tip is 
self-discovery, transformation, i.e. leadership development and mindset development. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor. Um, that's fantastic, fantastic uh, talk and a lovely background to hear who you were, what you are and what you will become. Um, and often when people think about you, people use you as a role model, as an inspiration. Has there been anyone in your life that's been your inspiration when you were pursuing these uh, leadership opportunities? Well, I, I, I can't think of one particular person, but I, I mean, I read a lot. I do a lot of learning that's not specific to, to medicine, but partly it's heritage, you know, and as I, uh, I'm discovering my heritage more and my identity. So I read a more, more about Gujarati culture. So I'm Gujarati yes. and people like uh, Mahatma Gandhi, for example, you know, and that does affect your leadership style because leadership styles generally are modest um, uh, around uh, kindness, you know, about cooperation, collaboration. So there are a lot of influences around it, but I, I would say that the things that have made me is what I saw when patients suffered through hmm. late diagnosis. That, that's my big thing for me, you know. Fantastic. Thank you, Professor. And there's many more questions to come once, once we get to our panel discussion uh, a bit later. So thank you. Um, so I'll hand over to um, someone who's uh, another inspiration for me, uh, Dr. Shahid Morali, to uh, take us on a journey through his life and where he is at the moment. Thank you, Abbas, for inviting me today. And I feel honored to be amongst uh, distinguished colleagues. I, I know the work of my colleagues well. I, I'm a fan of all their work. So I feel honored to be, to be part of this panel today. And this evening, I wanted to share with you my story. Um, my current roles are that I spend half my week working as a principal GP, uh, my base. And the other half of my week, I lead the Department of Primary Care Education at Aston Medical School. I had the opportunity to start there before the medical school opened for students. So it was a, a fantastic opportunity to, to develop and shape the curriculum. And I have oversight over uh, the clinical skills development of all the students throughout, throughout the medical school. And I had the opportunity here to, to teach and train faculty members how clinical skills can be taught to medical students. And now I'm seeing the fruit of that where our year three students are going into hospital placements and the clinicians who are supervising say, yeah, I would expect I'm ex I wouldn't have expected so much from a third year medical student. And as well as that, I have oversight and I, uh, I quality assure and recruit all GP practices for all our medical students for the whole five year program. And again, it's a great experience to be able to meet other colleagues and get them involved and help to upskill colleagues in medical education. Now, you may be aware that there's evidence in medical education literature to show that if medical students have more exposure to authentic primary care placements and experiences, it influences their career choice to actually become GPs. So it's great to be able to do that and influence our medical students for our profession. And also to make sure that those students see GPs as role models. Their first clinical placement is just as they start off. And I designed it that way. So they, they see a clinical placement with GPs right at the beginning of their medical school journey. And they see GPs training them in their core consultation, core clinical, core examination skills in their second year. And they have extended placements as well in their third year. So they, they have that longitudinal educational journey. And in addition, in my role at the medical school, I lead OSCEs. I write stations, train others how to write stations, and act as the main vigilator for OSCEs to leading teams of internal examiners as well. And another role that I have at the medical school is as the lead for the whole of the third year. So there I get to liaise and, and coordinate with directors of medical education in all our local hospitals, um, negotiating placement dates and placement activities. So it's, it, I, I really love my role there and the impact I can have. Now, if I think about my motivation to do the roles that I do, when I attain CCT, like many other people, I started off as a locum, and there I was responsible for the care of patients for that list that I had. And then I became a salaried GP and I was responsible for the care of cohorts of patients. And now in my role as a principal GP, I design and deliver care for thousands of patients, which is great. Before my current role, I was a postgraduate training program director. I was looking after many dozens of doctors in training 
of registrars. And there, I felt I could have an impact on many thousands of patient outcomes. And in my role here in the medical school, training hundreds of medical students, I feel that will have outcomes for many thousands of patients. So it's an increased scale. And I think that whole motivation comes through a value system of wanting to serve and help the community. And that originates from my faith. And I think, I believe my, my role as a, a leader is important for students, for doctors in training, for, for GPs, and with reference to ethnicity, if I come back to the previous point I made where if medical students see GPs as role models, they aspire to do something similar. If we are seen as visible role models, I hope for all those cohorts, it will inspire those into leadership positions too. Now, thinking about my journey, how I got here, as I mentioned, after CCT, did a bit of locum work, worked as a salary GP where I developed my skills as an undergraduate tu tutor, uh, became a training program director at Health Education England, and then my role here. And as I reflect, I, I actually think, I remember Health Education England to be such an inclusive employer. When I interviewed, I gave my experience in curriculum design in Sunday school work that I was doing as evidence. And they accepted that. And I, I, I thought that was awesome. And then I step back and I think, all right, well, in different areas, why aren't we seeing senior leadership positions representative of the demographics of those membership organizations? The RCGP, made up of a massive ethnicity, diversity of GPs. And, and yet, is, is it representative at the higher levels at council as an example? Health Education England loads of representation of different ethnicities amongst training program directors. But what about heads of school? And what about directors of primary care education? And then again, similarly at medical school, is the student body represented by the senior management team and deans and, 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 and those senior faculty members? And I don't believe so. And so now what I wanna do is I wanna think about maybe some, some obstacles. But before I discuss obstacles, I just want to raise the point that when I was thinking about my journey, I felt it was very important to think about networking, to be able to meet with the right people and to be able to be involved in the discussions that matter to me, to be visible. And so I found, similar to Mayo, interestingly, that I found a safe place to do this was the RCGP Regional Faculty Board. And so what I did is I actually actively sought to become a district representative there. And through this, I felt empowered in that safe environment to be able to engage in those important discussions that were important to me. Now, as I think about obstacles, these are difficult issues, sensitive issues. So I want to unpack something delicately here. And, and I want to focus on one issue. In order to be specific, in order not to overlap with my colleagues, and in order not to dilute points, and so with what I mentioned, I propose, and I'm gonna use my words carefully, I propose that there should be equal access of opportunity through culturally neutral networking opportunities. So I'll say that again. I propose that there should be equal access of opportunity through culturally neutral networking opportunity. And I'll explain. As I mentioned, it's important to network to be able to discuss with the right kinds of people. And, and to establish that equality of access for these networking systems, I think is very important. I'll explain a bit more specifically. As a Muslim, I'm uncomfortable about being around alcohol. Now, let me be clear. I don't speak for all Muslims. I don't uh, seek to uh, portray my viewpoints upon anybody else. And these are my own personal views and preferences, but I'm uncomfortable in, in such environments. Now, an example, I was invited by a very prominent school to be part of a careers event to advise school students uh, to enter into medical school. Now, these are for 17 year old students and their parents. It was the venue that the format was an auditorium panel discussion followed by a drinks reception. So I replied to accept the invitation, very politely, very tactfully said that I'll remain in the auditorium to answer any questions, but please excuse me from the drinks reception after. The reply I got was, don't worry, other drinks will be available. 
Now, this shows cultural naivety. And this was a very prominent school. And so when I'm talking about inclusivity of opportunity for culturally neutral events, it should also be important to make sure that these events are, are also accessible to all groups. The timing so that parents or those with caring responsibilities can attend, the type, the format, the venue. Let's think of an easy win here. Let's start thinking about RCGP events and maybe faculty events. As an example, if the AEGM is always held in a similar venue, organized by the same people, it's always a black tie event, and we notice that the same demographic or certain demographics are always attending a certain aren't, well, let's just do a, have a simple win and say, well, let's consider alternating venues on a rolling basis and types and format in order to offer that inclusivity to all. I'll finish with a couple of comments and a little bit of advice to, to my colleagues who, who are attending. Firstly, be comfortable, be confident in your own skin. I use those words deliberately. Be comfortable, be confident in your own skin. Value your skill sets and harness your motivators, your value base, whatever it is that motivates you. I mentioned faith as mine. I can't tell you. I interview so many medical students for entry to medical school. I can't tell you how many of them cite faith from all different aspects of faith as a motivator. And we have to tap into that as our internal motivator in those difficult days to improve our resilience. The other bit of advice I give to uh, offer to colleagues is to create those networking opportunities for yourselves and then be visible and strive. So thank you very much for, for hearing my story and I look forward to contributing to the question answer session afterwards. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Shahid. Very, very inspirational. And you've, you've inspired a lot of people, the, the chat function. And my personal phone is, is going off uh, um, quite quickly with, with messages in, in support of the things that, that you've brought up. We've got a question, and it's a question I've asked you before. So how did you jump from teaching medical students in, in practice, which lots of us do, to becoming training program director uh, at such a young age so quickly? Um, because it seems that a lot of us try and fail. So I'm not uh, ashamed to say I've applied four times and I've failed four times. But um, how did you manage to, to jump from one to another? I, 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 I would suggest it's, it's consider it to be as a career pathway and trajectory and keep increasing skill sets. So if, for example, you've developed your skills as an undergraduate tutor, then expand that in any capacity. Offer your uh, role to the university, even if it's doing things for free, just to develop that skill set to become an OSCE examiner or to become a personal tutor. And then increase that skill set by perhaps taking on a, a postgraduate certificate in medical education and furthering that as a diploma, if at all possible. And then gradually increasing your visibility, your opportunities, your skill sets, and then you'll be ready to apply for such roles like training program directors. And similarly for other positions between undergraduate and postgraduate education. And there are plenty of those roles available. And if, if GPs came to me and said, hey, you know, would you mind if I led some, some clinical skill sessions? Would you mind if I came and marked some assessments? Would you mind if I came in as an OSCE examiner? I'd say, hey, great, the more the merrier. So you will find universities willing to, to help and upskill colleagues and to be part of that journey too. Thank you, Shahid. And one final question from me. Where did you buy that shirt from? Because it looks brilliant. I've never seen a shirt like it. <laughs> this is my, my video shirt. <laughs> well, I'll ask no more. <laughs> Thank you, Shahid. Um, so we'll move on to, to Victoria um, to um, just hear a little bit more uh, about what makes you as a person uh, and to inspire us. Thank you. Thank you. And hello, everybody. Uh, what an honor to um, be talking to you today. So I'm Victoria Georgia Brown. Um, I'm the RCGP's Joint Honorary Secretary. I'm a GP in East London, in Tower Hamlets, a clinical commissioner, a researcher, and uh, probably most importantly, um, I'm a mom of uh, two girls, aged uh, nine and 11. And these may sound quite uh, overwhelming, and believe me, uh, they are often, uh, but they are also um, my choices. And I would like to underline the word uh, choices here, because uh, I count myself incredibly lucky that I've been able to choose um, 
not everybody does. And in fact, uh, despite the fact that uh, human rights uh, have been developed quite significantly over the recent years, there is a significant number of people that actually are unable still to pursue their dreams. I was also lucky uh, that I was born and raised in Greece, uh, which is a beautiful country with an amazing history, uh, but also a country riddled with wars. And uh, my own grandfather was one of at least 1.6 million people who were forcibly made refugees during the population exchange between Greece and Turkey in 1923. So he had to leave his home, all his possessions, his job, and move to mainland Greece and start all over again. And, and because of it, the history, I think most Greece uh, can relate to this pain of war, of having to flee your home. And probably this can explain the recent tremendous generosity of a, a relatively poor country to the new wave of refugees from Syria and Africa. So the first message I would like to send today is value and share your history even when painful, and I think particularly when painful, our history helps, un helps others understand where we are coming from and also gives us uh, humility, empathy, and compassion. And all these are qualities uh, interlinked with what motivated most of us to choose medicine, which is to help people. So um, here I am uh, in my clinical years at university, joining an, a European exchange program uh, and moving from a very sunny uh, city next to the sea to a district general hospital in the middle of the countryside without a car um, uh, during a particularly wet and cold winter. Um, and also with exams fast approaching, which meant that I had to revise quite significant uh, part of medicine in another language. Uh, and I'm sure some of you can relate to this. It was uh, tough. And I remember vividly uh, the empty corridor uh, of the hospital accommodation uh, during Christmas, uh, which I spent being on call. And uh, it felt incredibly lonely, uh, especially as at the time there was no FaceTime and the phone calls uh, to Greece were quite expensive. So uh, you may be wondering for how long I lasted. Um, well, I'm still here. Uh, and uh, it was not planned. And this is probably uh, the second message uh, that I would like to give you. Don't try to plan everything. Uh, there is something uh, magical, I think, to being open to new challenges, being curious and being uh, able to explore uh, new opportunities and avenues. I would like uh, our people to see life more as a, uh, an interesting journey rather than an automated route to a destination. Now, the reasons for which I stayed are multiple, uh, but I think the main one was that I fell in love, not just with this country, uh, but also with the NHS and its core principles, uh, the fact that it is available to all, irrespective of gender, race, disability, AIDS, or religion, and irrespective of the ability to pay. The second reason uh, was that I was made to feel part of a team. And the commitment to teamwork is something I have been lucky to experience uh, throughout my training, but also afterwards uh, when I worked at the hospital, in general practice, at uh, the commissioning group, and also uh, uh, within my research team at university. I never saw myself as a leader uh, with a traditional sense of the word. I have always uh, been part of a team striving to provide better care for our patients and was gradually given more and more responsibility. Which brings me to the third message. Being part of a team doesn't just bring joy uh, and uh, the very important feeling of belonging, but also I think is fundamental if we are to solve complex problems. It is what Matthew Sahid called the power of cognitive diversity. Now, uh, we all know that research has demonstrated that organizations investing in diversity are more successful and much more creative in finding solutions. However, diversity on its own is not enough. Uh, it, meaningful inclusion is what is needed. Uh, and I mean a change in culture uh, by which we allow all the different perspectives to come through, to come forward. So within my teams, I was lucky to have people who believed in me 
and helped me lift my insecurities. And I wouldn't have taken the initiative to join my local faculty when I got my MSCGP. It was the faculty board members at the time that encouraged me. Now, many of us relate to the imposter syndrome, but what I'm talking about here is not about doubt, doubting your own skills. It's about worrying that others are not noticing your skills, about being the outsider. When you worry that your skills may be invisible or underestimated because of your accent or because nobody can pronounce your surname or because you don't get all the local idioms and jokes. Uh, because you're different. And in such cases, I think having people who invite you, include you and support you can make a huge difference. And when discriminatory behavior comes out of nowhere and uh, shakes you to the core, having people who will stand up and speak up for you gives hope. Which brings me to the fourth message, take specific action. We all say we want to promote diversity and inclusion, but it feels to me that general protesting is just not enough. So how many of us are, are standing up and speaking out for our colleagues when we see discrimination happening in front of our eyes? It is specific and consistent action that will change our organizations and societies. So, it is good to see increasingly more examples of action against discrimination, but it's, it's still all too common for those who complain to be uh, seen as troublemakers. And actually, uh, they become sometimes so tired and uh, with their experiences that they think, uh, OK, uh, I'm close to giving up and they leave. Tracy Jolliffe, Director of Inclusion at the NHS Leadership Academy, said, the only people who are expected to get inclusion appear to be those most impacted by exclusion. I think this really needs to change. Everyone needs to understand and take action and especially those of us in leadership positions. And personally, I feel the weight of responsibility and duty to make sure that I do my bit. And by doing my bit, I mean, firstly, we need to create positive environments uh, where people feel safe to have frank conversations. We need to ensure that we can hear without making negative judgments or assumptions or denying the messages that we hear. Secondly, we need to support positive relationships where people feel that what they do and what they think does matter. And thirdly, we need to break free from the echo chambers that surround us and develop innovative kind of outsider mindsets. Now, I think uh, this requires a conscious effort and I think probably it's the most difficult of the three. It is quite paradoxical, but it has been shown that by increasing the scale in which we operate and by expanding our teams and by engaging more in social media, unless we are careful we run the risk of becoming part of even more closed and homogeneous groups. And this is where I think Socrates, uh, critical thinking becomes really important. It is the art of questioning assumptions, reflecting on values, examining reasoning, seeking evidence, uh, and considering really the implications of our actions. Now, critical thinking is not just important skill for leaders in positions of power, uh, but I think it's really important characteristic of good followers. And we need to invest a lot more time, energy uh, in learning it, in practicing it, and also teaching it to our children, because it will determine uh, our choices and our children's choices, both as leaders and as followers. So uh, I think uh, we have a lot of people in this um, meeting. Uh, we are all at different stages in our career journeys but we have all chosen medicine, which is one of the most caring professions. And each one of us here today has a unique story and a dream. So let's learn from the stories and enable the dreams. And let's apply the lens of the outsider, which a lot of us know pretty well. Let's create inclusive teams, take specific action, be curious, listen, and speak up. And our journeys uh, will be a lot richer for it. So thank you. Thank you very much, Victoria. It's very, very inspiring, particularly the journey that you mentioned at the beginning. I didn't even know that. So that, that's really, really inspiring to, to hear. Um, how do you 
continue to grow and develop as a leader yourself? Because obviously you are quite, you know, advanced in, in, in that particular respect. How do you continue growing as a leader? Well, thank you. I don't see myself as very advanced at all. Um, uh, I, I, I think um, we are at the journey, as I said before, and uh, being curious to understand where people are coming from uh, makes you grow even more and makes you understand yourself as well and uh, your assumptions and uh, your motivations. Uh, and I think um, if we are all better at listening to others uh, and reading, as Mario uh, said, it's not just listening to others in, in our uh, time, but also learning from our history and uh, those that have been there before us, um, we will all uh, continue to improve. But I don't think that this is leadership is a kind of um, a destination that you reach at any time. It's a continuous journey of improvement, like medicine a little bit. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Victoria. Um, so uh, next we move on to speak to Dr. Nikita Kanani. She needs no introduction. Um, uh, she's, uh, thank you very much for taking time out of your busy schedule to join us. I'm, uh, I'm, I, I guess over the last two weeks, you've probably spent every waking minute in one meeting or another. I don't know how you do it, how you keep going. <laughs> Um, thanks, Abba. Thank you so much for having me. It's a real, it is a real pleasure to be here, and um, I uh, this is important, uh, really, really important. So thank you for including me. Um, yes, it's, I think it's been like that for everyone, though, hasn't it? The last, um, particularly this year, I think the you know the majority of this year has been uh, fairly um, chaotic and all encompassing, and um, it's something that we've all had to sort of try and manage and uh, live through um, and live through with our families and our extended families and um, really feeling some of that quite acutely. Um, but, uh, you know, thank you for having me. I thought I might just reflect on sort of, um, as, you, as, as you asked, uh, just uh, a little bit about where I've come from, um, what has been important to me, and then I hope uh, have a wider discussion, if that's all right, Abbas. So, um, look, I, um, I was born in uh, in the UK uh, to a refugee dad and an economic migrant mum um, and that that could be quite confusing as you're growing up um, because your sense of identity gets really quite thrown um, when you're not quite sure where you belong um, I remember uh, knowing I was different uh, about the age of my daughters I've got uh, two children I have a uh, an eight-year-old soon to be known tomorrow, and I've got a twelve-year-old. So I was about my daughter's age when I realised that I was different, um, and I, I, I still vividly remember kids pointing and, and laughing and saying they could see um, a stool running down my legs, um, and and I was I was really thrown, and I was sort of looking and realised, of course, it was just the colour of my legs. And I went home and I ran upstairs and I covered myself in talcum powder, and I remember saying to my mum, "I'm white now, so I don't really understand what the issue is." Um, and it's not an isolated incident, and many of you will have had um, experiences um, along the way that just throw you. Um, I have been picked up on my uh, grammar and my accent and my phrasing uh, more than I can remember. Um, I uh, actually grew up only speaking speaking Gujarati uh, for the first five years of my life, but actually, um, as recently as this year, I have been... Uh, privately uh, in a chat being offered a dictionary um, to make sure that I'm clearer when I speak um, which is uh, really challenging especially when you're in a position where you should um, you'd hope to escape some of this um, but it's always been the case um, I, I think many people will recognize that you know year after year you get uh, challenged in different ways you know uh, even if you uh, do well, um, you know, there's, a, there's that bit of surprise, haven't you done well for you? Um, people like you do really well, don't they? Um, well, what does that mean? Um, you know, uh, this isn't quite the right role for you. And um, you sort of get that um, feeling of anxiety, and, and Victoria say, said it really well, you know, that sort of, uh, I guess, it, uh, an, in, an imposter syndrome of some sort. Um, but I, I just want to reflect on something a good friend of mine talks about. Um, so I went to university with Rakashri, and she um, did a wonderful um, BMG, uh, BMG, BMJ uh, blog recently about reframing uh, the imposter phenomenon. And so for those of you who aren't aware, imposter phenomenon is that that, that phenomenon of, of feelings of persistence about being found out as a fraud. And sometimes some of those comments in the background can chip away at you and make you think, 
maybe I don't know what I'm doing. Maybe, maybe I can't quite do as well as I thought I did, or I didn't do X, Y, and Z in the way that I should have done. Um, but actually, what she talks about is uh, something called testimonial uh, justice, which is essentially um, when you uh, have what's, what's, you're regarded as having a credibility deficit. Um, uh, so your symptoms um, are not uh, believed or taken seriously. And so you kind of embed this feeling that you're not really doing things right. Um, and I'm sharing this because it's important because this still happens um, to this day. Um, this happens to colleagues across um, uh, workforces, plural, not just in the health service. But I think what we really need to be doing is talking about these stories. This is why I wanted to be here this evening, Abbas. I want to be really honest about some of the things that many of us will face uh, through our careers and say, actually, what is going to be different this time? And Victoria talked about some of this um, really clearly and really passionately, I think. You know, this is our chance to talk talk about our stories, stories of others, raise the awareness and create opportunities for others. And I'm really, um, I'm really mindful of that now. This is our chance to make a cultural commitment, to make a difference now. Um, my son uh, over lockdown, um, and it had just been after George Floyd, so he was uh, slightly more kind of anxious generally when he was just about allowed to go out and Mr. Spike was doing during the uh, sort of end of lockdown. And I remember the first time he ran into a group of police and he cycled back and he was shaking. And I was like, well, you know, had, had you done anything wrong? What were you worried about? He's, and he, he just said, no, I just thought that they were going to get me. And and it made me think, you know, I need to be making that difference now, making that cultural commitment now to help us build that diversity of thinking and behaviour and belief to really change the way that we work and for us to change the way that we uh, deliver care. And that is very simple sometimes. Um, and some of you have worked with me in the past, you know, even um, really, really uh, straightforward things. You know, if you're looking at an image of something, what does that image represent? If you're creating a document, what does that say? If you've got some narrative, for example, around the COVID vaccination programme, how are we going to support our communities from diverse ethnic backgrounds to really engage? So how do we build that diversity of thinking in? And it even plays into things like, so as I mentioned, it's my daughter's birthday tomorrow. So tonight I'll be making a, a in the wee hours, um, a jellaby uh, cake. Um, I have no idea how I'm doing it yet, but that, that, that will come, but that is what we need to be thinking about. Um, so how do we start being uh, comfortable with being uncomfortable, with kind of raising some of uh, this awareness, some of these stories? I think for me, there's three main things, and then I'll stop. Um, First of all, uh, Victoria said it as well, have a tribe around you. One of the most important things for me is my tribe. And you have tribes in different ways. We will all have experienced tribes in different ways. But having people around you, people who look like you, who speak like you, who recognise the challenges that you might be facing, as well as people who don't speak like you, look like you, uh, work like you, so that you can see that um, that gap sometimes and see sometimes what needs to be bridged, you know, and it's really um, important um, for me to have uh, both of those roles, um, uh, those tribes around me. Um, but then you use that tribe and you take others with you. There's absolutely no excuse for putting that ladder down and making sure that other people are able to access the sorts of opportunities that you're able to um, uh, uh, access. Um, you know, we often talk about uh, career progression for people from diverse backgrounds. We say there's a lack of opportunities. There is, uh, you know, existing discrimination. And those things happen. But actually, what, what often happens is, is, is coupled with an absence of um, role models, an absence of mentors, an absence of creating space for others. And I think that is our job now. And that's certainly something that I think is very important for me. So having a tribe, uh, taking others with you. And then finally, I think using your voice and um, being your whole self. And by that, I mean, when I first started having coaching conversations years ago, my coach um, was sort of saying, well, what about you as an Asian woman in this world? I'd be like, oh, no, 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 that's not relevant to this. Um, and I was sort of saying, you know, I, I would say it's not relevant. And he was saying, no, 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 no. You are Asian and you're a female and you're a mum and you're a clinician. You know, all these things in spaces where often those things don't exist. And you have to be your whole self and you have to use that voice powerfully and confidently, no matter how anxious and imposter-like you might feel, in order to say uh, very clearly that actually something has to be different, something has to shift. We have to bring other people to the table. We have to create uh, communications that are diverse and far-reaching. Um, so 
uh, finding your tribe, um, taking others with you, using your voice um, and ultimately being your whole self. And whether that is um, about uh, creating a shift in national policy and asking our policy and political colleagues and others to think differently, or it's about creating a cake that has jellyby in it and on it, um, we will see. Um, that's what our job has to be. And um, that's what I think I'm here for. Thanks, Tabas. Fantastic, Nikki. That's Brilliant. I'm honestly, I'm, I'm speechless. That's completely floored me. There's some of the uh, levels of aggression that, that you face both as a child and and even up until up until this year. So um, where do we go from here? What, what does the future hold for, for, for our community? How do we progress? What what should we be doing over the next few years to really make our voice heard? Oh, great question. Look, I think you'll know I'm, I am a, a fair bit of an optimist. So I think this is, I, I think we're actually at a, a real um, shifting point at the moment. I think this is, this, is, this is the year that we are finding our voices. We're coming together in a way that we haven't before, whether it is uh, our, our WhatsApp groups, um, other spaces like this where we're coming and listening, just listening to each other's stories, asking each other questions, because that creates unity and power. And that starts to say that, you know, um, uh, incredible work, Fisa's work, Mo's work, you know, bringing together um, networks that are going to start to say, look, let's change the people around the table. Let's change the voices that we listen to, because actually that is going to be the stuff that's going to make a difference for our communities. And 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 it's small things, and we can all do this, you know. Um, I, I, I was delighted to have a piece in Eastern Eye. Um, my written Gujarati is terrible now, but they translated it, and then that meant that I could take that to my grandparents and uh, actually post it to them because obviously I couldn't go in at that uh, well I can't go in now either but they only read Gujarati so they could sit there and they're reading it over the phone to me and go did you really say that oh this is great and it's in their language and it resonated for them and so actually I'm really optimistic that this is the charge that's going to shift the way that we work and that we're going to be each other's um, bodies and advocates in a way that I don't think we've seen in the past. Brilliant. No, thank you. I mean, I think your 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 speech was was certainly um, it was the key that unlocked the floodgates. We've, uh, the whole chat section is completely flooded with people resonating with the experiences you've had. We've got Carter who said there's nothing micro about microaggressions. It can be one of the most damaging forms of racism. We've got Maria Rashid who said getting speech and grammar corrected is so common, and often the person offering the correction is another colleague. Um, we've got Van who said that even at medical school he was told. Uh, that um, the face, uh, my face doesn't fit the mold at medical school. So lots and lots of comments resonating with you and a lot of respect to you. I know uh, Prof has got a, a point to make, so I'm just gonna bring him in as well. Um, well, I just wanted to say two things. Firstly, on behalf of all the GPs in the country, I think as immediate past president of the college, I should like to thank Nikki for her leadership during the COVID-19 pandemic. I think this has been extraordinary. Uh, it's not been easy. Uh, those of you who worked at national level will know the challenges that go on at that level. But I saw Nikki um, in the two webinars on COVID-19 vac vaccine uh, presentations. I must say, I've never seen so much passion dedication and determination. And I think we should recognize that leadership, the role models I look up to her and in due course, I think, you know, be regarded as an epoch making uh, contribution. So I think I want to say that in a public meeting of the college. The other thing to say, I think Nikki is right. You know, I want everyone on this call to know this is a time of opportunity. I know there's a lot of difference. Um, I know that we see microaggression. I know that we've had experience of structural racism. I know, particularly during COVID, that that has been exposed. But you know, look at the progress we've made. You know, and uh, how much that we have in common that unites us. Uh, hence, my earlier presentation that you know Britain is the best country to be a BAME doctor. There's everything to play for. We have opportunities. Of course, there are things to uh, deal with, things that need to be better, you know? But um, let's capitalize on those opportunities because we do have more in common. And I think in that way, we can move forward. 
Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mayo. And Nik Nikita, will you be joining us for, for the Q&A a bit later? I know you've got meetings lined up. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be trying to stay on um, so Good. thank you. I'd, I'd love Fantastic. to. Brilliant. So we've got we've got a whole vast list of questions that people have been sending in to ask you. So uh, that's brilliant. So let's move on to uh, bring in uh, Dr. Oleg Benga um the uh, founder and chair of Nigerian GPs UK. Um, I'm really excited to, to hear um, your presentation. Uh, and I've got a couple of questions actually that have been pre-asked uh, in preparation for you. So uh, without further ado, please, please take the center stage. Well, thanks. Thanks, Dr. Tijani. Um, yeah, my name is uh, Benga Gubadi Joe. I'm a GP in the in the Manchester area, and also currently the director of um, IPK Health Solutions. We are a company that offers innovative sort of primary care delivery, and we recently got our CQC registration for the services that we provide. Um, recently, I uh, up to recently, I was a clinical lead and GP advisor in my primary care organisation as well. And in my spare time, I still do a little bit of work for them. So I actually want to, to thank RCGP and Dr. Tajani for, for putting this together. It's a, it's a big privilege to be amongst the panelists that you've put me with today. Um, some of them have been very influential in the growth of the organization that I, I represent, um, Nigerian GPs in the UK. Um, in terms of BIM leadership for me, I think we fall largely into two categories. I think um, the first one would be BAME doctors that lead organizational, um, that, that lead in organizational settings or in clinical settings. And the second would be leading a BAME group. You can also have a mixture of both, someone that does both. I think I'm speaking more from the perspective of leading a BAME group today. And Nigerian GPs is the association that I do represent. Uh, it's, a, it's an association that was formed to, to offer support to doctors in our community, um, learning from our experiences and using what we know to ease the journey of those that are coming after us, really. Um, we do quite a bit for the IMG GPs or the BAME, BAME GP trainees as well, um, CSA courses, mentorship programs, monthly webinars, and we help we offer also an area sort of like a safe space for our colleagues to have conversations i think speaking about my my background i was born and grew up in nigeria um, my parents did live studied and they worked in the uk for quite a long time before relocating back to to nigeria and there was sort of a sense of britishness already in the family um, my mom was a very huge fan of the royal family um, and to our delight she had me on the same day and year as prince william so it was it was quite um it, she, she really she really loved that um as such coming to the uk was quite an easy opportunity or an easy decision for me to make really i think my initial years in the uk the challenges that i did face was what spurred me into into creating the Nigerian GPs in the UK group. Um, and what was the main challenge? It was, I think it was all about integration really. I think in, integration initially was, was quite a struggle. Um, the level of integration that I had back home um, in my community, among my doctors, the social setting, that was very difficult to achieve when I came here initially. So I did realize quite earlier on that there's quite a lot of work to be done. Uh, amongst my friend, I had a friend also that shared that same view and we decided to put in work into how, how best we would like to tackle the problem of integration. I did, I came in, I did a, an MBA in healthcare management in the University of Aberdeen. So coming straight from Nigeria and going straight to Aberdeen was quite a big cultural shock and difference. Um, the culture, the language, the Scottish accent, um, there were quite a lot of huge differences. And even though I was coming from an English speaking setting um, where we did have a good command of English, um, it, was, it was about the way people spoke, the small talks, you know, trying to engage um, with, with, with my colleagues. That was where difficulties were. And, you know, constantly you feel like you were misunderstood or your conversations were 
sometimes a bit awkward with most of your Caucasian peers. And for me, that was a, a real challenge. So we, we, we decided to make that as a priority to, to sort of improve on. And uh, my friend and I went to the language department. We booked an appointment with the a senior lecturer there to say, we'd like you to give us tips and how can we you know, communicate better? How can we integrate better into the society? And it was quite an enlightening moment because she did give us a lot of talks about things to do. Um, the cultural difference as well, when I came into the NHS, was, it was a big one because um, it, there was so, the communication style was quite different. I mean, Nigeria is quite um, hierarchical in terms of the way you relate to your elders. Um, you, you're meant to be seen to be humble. You're meant to be seen to respect elders by only you know, speak when spoken to. And that in the UK then was usually translated, especially in the clinical setting as probably you've been a bit dull or you're not engaging appropriately. And we also had almost a culture of don't ask unless you're offered in terms of um, asking for favors. And sometimes in the UK, it seemed that that was misinterpreted as you being okay at the, at the current level you were. I, I remember um, after my first CSA, my only CSA exam, um, my clinical supervisor asked me for feedback how I performed. And I, I think I, I, I sold myself short. I said, I don't think I did well. And he said, you know what? I think we should start your preparation now before the result comes out. And we started doing, <laughs> we started doing preparations. Uh, we started having sessions before the result came out. And, and thankfully, I did, I did pass quite comfortably. So when I reflected back on that, it just, it was, it was, it's still all part of the cultural difference. It's not, it's not selling myself well. Um, so all that challenge was what sort of brought me to forming the organization Nigerian GPs in the UK. I think um, the journey, the challenges that I faced, a lot of my friends also were facing it. A few of them were two, three years behind me in the training program. So we dis so the desire to help others sort of coming through the same pathway was really at the heart of how the group started. And so we, we were providing solutions to the problem that we encountered and overcame. So we started as a WhatsApp group and initially it was about five of us, 10 of us. We, we spoke about pertinent issues, um, things that we faced and people kept bringing people in and we, we grew to the point where we are more than 270 at the moment. We've made it a formal organization. Um, we, we've elected ESCOs, we have a program in place, we have visions for the year as well. So I think our ability as, um, the, what, what, what makes, what, what does it mean to be a BAME leader? I would say, I think to me, um, based on my experience, it's not necessarily about having uh, a senior role in a hierarchy of an organization, especially if you're leading the BAME, BAME community. I think it's more about the art of motivating people and to achieving a common goal. And so I do believe that potentially we're all um, BAME leaders insofar as we, we seek to dutifully positively impact people and give direction to other BAME doctors in our own sphere of, of influence. I think uh, also we have a unique ability to, to see through our own lens, through our own journey, um, the new doctors coming through and see how we can help them. So I always approach this by thinking, what could I have done when I was 26 um, that I didn't know then? And that is what I potentially would want to help others coming in to the country um, to do. I think for me, there are three key things I would like to encourage, especially the IMG BAME doctors. Um, the first one is to integrate. Um, the society is ours now. Um, we just have to use it. I think most of us sell ourselves short. We don't integrate as much as we, we should. It's, it's almost like having a gym subscription and I'm not going to use it. I think a few of us will, will be familiar with that. Um, so I think an, an easy way to integrate would be 
doing what you're good at, what you're passionate at, and with people outside your own immediate circle. Um, so if it's sports, if it's running, if it's football, if it's gym, even religious practices, you can do that outside your own circle. Even though it's, it's human nature to gravitate towards your own type. However, I think for my experience over this last six to eight months of building my own business in the healthcare industry, I think my integration has opened doors and it's unlocked quite a lot of potentials. So I, I, it's, it's good to be clear that integration doesn't necessarily mean, you know, assimilation where you lose your identity, uh, but it's about you being confident about it and sort of showcasing it, showcasing your differences uh, confidently as well. It's usually a two-way thing. And I do believe that quite a lot of um, people are open to, to learning new cultures. And secondly, I would like to say we should try to be exemplary. Um, and I think the truth of the matter is we are, I am a representation of you and you're also a representation of me. Um, so we sort of owe it to each other to promote good behavior amongst the BAME community. Um, and we can do this by ensuring that we work hard, we keep learning and developing, and we do not tolerate misconduct amongst ourselves. I, I see that, um, I see us all as leaders, as I said, and I think we should keep setting leadership goals. Um, like Prof said, sometimes you fall into these positions. It's also good to also have a mindset a long-term goal, set smart leadership objective and take it easy and get, take time to, to get to where you like to be. And third and very importantly, I would encourage us all, especially the IMG um, BAME doctors to engage with our associations, to attend our meetings, the, the BMA, the RCGP, the GMC, the LMC. I think we should be visible and engage in order to have a say. And to use the phrase from Sheryl Sandberg, um, we should all lean in. So thank you. My three key points would be to integrate, to engage, and to be exemplary. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Benga. That, that, that was so inspirational. Honestly, honestly, so inspirational. You know, when you started that talk, um, by saying, you know, um, thank you for inviting me amongst all these esteemed panelists and, and speakers, and I don't know what I'm doing here. Actually, you are one of the first names on our list of panelists. So honestly, so inspirational. Um, I've got a question that's been asked in advance for you, um, if you don't mind, that um, the recent research on COVID-19 inequalities in the uh, Black and minority ethnic community um, and the Black Lives Matter movement really have shone a light on how health inequalities faced in the community um, how, how divisive they are and how many health inequalities we face in the community. How do you reconcile your feelings as a patient and a practitioner, as, as a member of the population and as someone who serves the population as a doctor? Yeah, I think for me, initially when the information came out, it was one of the first times that I did feel quite worried about going to work. I did see myself as more vulnerable. So um, getting, having that information affected me in a lot of ways. Um, so, and it was important to see that there were measures being put in place. I actually then did a survey um, where I contacted all the CCGs to get them to see what are they actually doing with regards to um, sort of promoting risk assessments in the workplace for, for BAME doctors. So I was quite passionate about it as well. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and before we move on to, to our final panelist, I know that um, Professor Mayor um, may need to leave in the next 10, 15 minutes or so because of uh, another meeting elsewhere, and we thank him again for his time. Um, there are a couple of questions I wanted to ask uh, Professor before, before he goes. Um, and I think one of the ways to, to lead into that is actually on a couple of questions we've, we, we've had before. So there was a question, how can we as young physicians access uh, BAME mentors, Black and minority ethnic mentors. And actually, before the event started, um, I got a message from someone saying that um, she trained as a coach to support the Stepping Up program for aspiring BAME leaders, um, which is very underutilized. And please, could you share the link for the NHF Stepping Up program for aspiring BAME leaders? So I'm about to put that on the chat function. But I also wanted to bring uh, Professor Mayor in to talk a little bit about the Faculty of Medical Leadership um, uh, and explain about the uh, mentorship uh, side of things uh, with that. 
So can I say, um, first of all, training, development, and um, support for medical leadership is very important, whether you're BAME or non-BAME, right? For example, if you had a serious surgical problem, would you want to be operated on by a person who is not a trained surgeon? I would suggest not, yeah? You don't want somebody who is experimenting or trying or chancing it, yeah? Therefore, why do we expect GPs to suddenly lead organizations that have budgets of one billion pounds, you know, or CCGs of 500 million pounds? You need training and development. Now, can I say, thanks to the work of people like Nikki and other leaders, there's never been a better time to get access to coaching, mentoring, and support. So if you uh, join the Faculty of Medical Leadership and Management, you get free access to mentoring. Can I say, I, I'm not here to kind of promote to sell the, facul uh, sell the faculty, but just to say that, you know, there is a professional home for you. There is this idea of credentialing and standards, right? As I said in my presentation, two things, if there's one thing that you take away, one message is two things, self-discovery and self-transformation. To be a leader, you have to know yourself. Um, to know how you interact with people, the conflicts, the relationships, the collaboration. You usually need help with that. And uh, that's a positive thing. So mentoring is available through FMLM. Plus, you know, it's like any medical specialty. We have standards for it. You can prove your credentialing. So credentialing is another key word for the medical profession. Fellowship is another key tradition in medicine. But can I say you'll get support through the college, through a lot of other institutions, but mentoring and coaching, I wish I'd had that much earlier in my career. You know, uh, I know it was seen as uh, something that was, well, it was airy fairy, it doesn't really make a difference. But now I know more than ever that coaching and mentoring and development is a powerful way to examine yourself, to self-reflect and to develop yourself. So I think the faculty is there for you. We're very much influenced by the work of the medical Royal Colleges, including the Royal College of GPs. And, you know, this is a great time of opportunity. Uh, take it up, but develop yourself as a leader. You know, there's nothing automatic about being a leader. You can't just suddenly become a good leader. Uh, the perspective is important of primary care. But like I said in my first presentation, the mindset, you know, leadership is judged by great ideas, by reports, by landmark thinking. So develop yourself in communication, in public presentation, in managing small and large teams. How much training do we get in managing large teams? I'm not sure, you know, we need to work on that, you know, managing conflict, having a difficult conversation, these are all skills that GPs have, but we need to professionalize them in the, in the era of, in the arena of um, professionalism uh, and medical leadership. So I would say, you know, two things, time of opportunity, lots of support available now in terms of roles. We'll see what roles are available and the support, particularly looking in the, in the NHS scheme of looking after yourself in the NHS people plan. Um, so go for it. And I look forward to working with you. Fantastic. Thank you, Prof. Um, I understand from uh, someone that uh, your start time for your next meeting is a bit, is a bit delayed. So that's good to be with us. Um, so I'll hand over to Margaret as well, a fantastic inspiration for all of us young doctors. Um, so Margaret, please tell us a bit more about your background and where you are at the moment and what the future holds for you. Thank you, Abbas, uh, for inviting me to this amazing platform this evening. And good evening, everyone. 
Um, I'm Margaret, I'm a GP in Hull. Um, I was born in South London um, and had a rather nomadic lifestyle because my mum uh, was a journalist. Currently, I'm a GP partner in Hull, a trainer, appraiser. I warn you, I wear quite a few hats. I joke, and I stop joking, that I've probably got some hyperactivity disorder that's yet to be diagnosed. I'm the Associate Medical Director for Primary Care for Hull York Medical School. I'm the Faculty Chair for Humber. I'm on the RCGP Task uh, Black, Asian and Minority Ethnic Group. I'm trying to say it in full because like some of our panel members, I don't acknowledge the term BAME. And in fact, uh, I recall Doyen Atta Logogunda who um, she co-conducted the Fair to Refer report actually stipulated that we should try and just spell it out in full. Um, I'm also the NIHR, so the National Institute for Health Research, Yorkshire and Humber, first five and AIT lead for research. I'm the research lead for our PCN and I'm a job in GP, so I work four days a week and I'm a mother of two. So I say this not to boast, but really just to um, give you an example of my leadership journey. So for the next nine minutes, I'm just going to explain how I embarked on this leadership journey, which was pr primarily born out of curiosity. Um, I'm always asking why. In fact, when I was growing up, my mum was a, and I'm gonna talk about, a little bit about my parents, if that's okay. She was a freedom fighter. Um, in fact, she fled her country um, because she was fighting against the colonial powers of what was known as formerly Rhodesia and now Zimbabwe. In fact, she was incarcerated for uh, some time in that country and met my dad in the UK with the fiber in a pocket. And um, she, he was actually one of the founding members for an organization called the Black Panthers in, in London. And so I was really born into a household where social uh, justice, uh, fairness, equity um, was really strong. Uh, there was always a debate, there was always a meeting. In fact, I remember our house being labeled the United Nations at one point because there was almost so much activity going on. But what was really important, the reason why I mentioned them is because they have probably been the two most influential people in my life um, in terms of being a little bit of a rebel sometimes and a positive uh, disruptor. So um, I guess the reason why I always ask why, and I'm called a doubting Thomas in my household, um, had led me and sparked my passion for research delivery in primary care. I'm resisting the urges to go down the route of academia, but who knows? Um, and I do remember early on um, in South London, it, being the daughter of a rebellious parents, you tend to naturally rebel yourself, which I did. And when you don't have those positive influences in school, I remember my careers teacher telling me, you know, you, you're doing the sciences and maths, Margaret, and you're really good at them. But, you know, you've just started working in um, your local supermarket. They've got really good job um, perspectives, you know, positions there. And um, so, and, and that's slowly when you get those messages fed into you continuously, it's really hard to resist the urge to not think otherwise. And I remember uh, sitting on a train on the Northern Line a few years, a few years back, and I was heading towards King's to do a biochemistry degree. And I thought, why am I doing this? This is not what I want to do. Um, so the short version is I never made it to King's. In fact, a week later, I found myself in the Czech Republic doing a medical degree. And then as a salary GP in Leeds, I, uh, we moved because I fell in love like Victoria um, and moved over to Hull. And here I've been for the last 10 years, I've been fortunate to find a practice that embraces diversity, inclusion, we're diplomatic. They are my second family and I'm very grateful for it. And two years into my role as a partner, when I just finished uh, my GP training uh, to become a trainer, because I've had very positive influences as GP trainers myself. I saw an advert for uh, the role of educational lead in our uh, faculty bulletin. And I had no interaction with faculty up until that point. But one of my gripes was I felt that, that there wasn't enough CPD out there that reflected the learning needs of our membership. For example, I think at the time, I was really concerned about things like FGM, um, well-being of, um, of, of a lot of the medical professionals. So I thought, you know what, let me just go for it. And I, I got it. I did it for two years. Um, and it was a little bit, it was really, I mean, I'm so grateful for, for that experience because I was an educational lead for an area called White Rose, which is Yorkshire and Humber and South Yorkshire and Northern Trent. And the power of networking and meeting like-minded positive people really um, inspired me with regards to what the faculties were doing. 
However, the journey from the Far East in Hull to the Far West in Warrington uh, took its toll, but I remained on the faculty board. And about two years ago, around this time, I remember turning up to our AGM and someone said to me, it was the regional manager, she said, right, um, we've been having a chat, a couple of us, and we'd like you to think about running for chair. And I just remember looking at her thinking, you are joking. And, um, and I said my usual, why? And she looked back at me and she said, why not? And I thought, okay, okay, I can do this, I can do this. And I said, yes. Um, and two years in, it's been, it's been a real, <laughs> real bit of a roller coaster. And I must confess to you, I don't think I genuinely appreciated, appreciated the role of chair up until last year when we had our second AGM. So in my first year as AGM, we had a, a dinner that um, we were fortunate to have Helen Stokes, our former um, chair, come along and gave an inspirational speech. And in the second year last year, we had Mike Holmes, our current vice chair, talk. But what was notably different was there was a significant number of black medical students at this event. And I was really, you know, I mean, it was, I felt like I was back in, you know, South London in a, in a, in a club, really. <laughs> I shouldn't say, shouldn't acknowledge that. And I said, I went up to one of the students and I said to him, you know, uh, I'm really curious, where were you all last year? And he said, um, we, you know, what happened essentially? And he replied, he said, you happened. And he explained that they'd never really been exposed to anyone in any form of kind of leadership role um, that was black from any of the colleges. And I was so humbled. And, and then you feel that kind of weight of responsibility all of a sudden. But then I also felt really sad and my husband said to me on the way home, he said, why, why are you sad? And I said, well, I'm not being funny, but if the book stops with me in terms of what they view as leadership, that's not a good thing. So when you look at, someone talked about, I think it was Dr. Morali, the lack of diversity and people who look like us at board level, at trust level, within senior roles, despite the fact that we make up more than 40% of this NHS, is scandalous. So with the summer and spring of discontent that we've had with the murder of George Floyd on May the 25th and COVID exposing those open wounds that we knew existed. I remember having some international graduate trainees come to me and say, why are we seeing all these COVID patients face to face? And I thought, mm, really? But we did a survey and the results of the survey were stark. I emailed, I, you know, I just thought I'm gonna email Professor Fenton. And it was acknowledged that this, this is not a good thing. Um, and the issues my parents were facing in the 70s are still being experienced and is ongoing. But like Nikki alluded to earlier, we are now starting to find the voices. Martin Marshall, our chair, took the brave step and it was a brave step because a lot of colleges are looking at us as leaders in, in what we're doing for our black, Asian and minority ethnic population. And he opened up the position of national chair to, to all of us. And I thought, this is great, do you know what? And I actually, uh, I was a proposer for a couple of people and I thought we really need the young, new next generation to go where we didn't have the courage to go before. And I remember Benga ringing me up and texting me and I've never met a lot of people in person, but I feel like the bonds we've formed virtually over the last six months have been amazing. And it was the day before my birthday and he said to me, we need you to run. <laughs> and I went, why? <laughs> And he said, why not? And I thought, you know, took me back to a year ago when I was at that AGM. So I said, okay. So those seeds that Maya sowed last year in summer with the president's listening exercise for black GPs, it's only really now that we're beginning to see the small early shoots of progress. We still have a, a long way to go, but my message to those of you out there who are listening, if you've ever thought about stepping up or into a role, that you feel passionate or curious about, go for it, embrace it. I had a young doctor of Indian origin approach me recently. He's been promoted to a rather senior role in the trust. And he said, someone's already approached him and said, you know, how old are you? And I said to him, don't let anyone make you feel inferior without your consent. That's a Roosevelt quote. You know, I listed a number of CEOs who are younger than him that are doing amazing things. So, be courageous because it takes a lot, like all the leaders on this platform today, to step up. The minute you step up to anything, there are people that will want to tear you down. That's just normal. But the difference now is we have unity. We have, we're like a wolf pack. 
if you come for one of us, there's, there's an army behind each and every one on this platform. So be courageous, be empathic, and just embrace it. And if you ever, ever doubt yourself or let that seed start to grow, always go back to your why. So I'm just going to close with two quick slides. I don't know if Kim, if you've, you're able to put them up. If not, don't worry. And the two slides are really just to honour the people in uh, my lifetime um, who are my parents. And we recently celebrated their wedding anniversary. Um, and I've been waiting to say this all evening. Next slide, please. And the next slide should really be a picture where I remember I sat around a table, we were discussing fellowship and I must have kind of looked disinterested in the whole affair. And someone said to me, well, you know, you don't seem to uh, look too engaged here, Margaret. And I actually made the comment, well, that's because no one looks like me. And then a couple of years after that, then I, I kind of put my foot in it. So I probably, you know, talk myself into that role. So those are the people around me who are inspirational leaders, my family, my homes, and of course, my Lakani that's with us today. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you, everyone. Wow, Margaret, thank you so much. That was so inspirational. That was absolutely brilliant. You've completely blown my mind. Uh, I, just, just to hear the journey with, you know, your parents with, uh, I, I love the statement about the UN household. And I think that just encapsulates um, the journey that you've been on and actually um, what diversity actually has brought to the table um, in terms of, from your point of view. Um, and I guess it kind of leads into a question that someone's asked, and that's why I want to pose it to you specifically. Um, and, and the question is, how do we stop getting increasingly sensitive? And I, I guess the question is, do we need to stop? Um, but how do we stop getting increasingly sensitive about microaggressions and reductionism? With being involved in so many events and talks about uh, black and minority ethnic issues and institutional racism, I'm able to, uh, I, I, I'm really feeling it uh, lately. Yeah, it's difficult because particularly when there's, I don't think there's a day that goes by that you don't hear a story that you just think, I don't think I could hear another tragic story. They're just endless. So it's normal. I think it's just acknowledging it and internalizing it, but not forgetting what the bigger picture is. For example, I'm sensitive about the term black, Asian, minority, ethnic. And I know we all know it's not an appropriate term, but we've got bigger fish to fry. Um, so yes, we're aware of the microaggressions or the macroaggressions. We all understand what they are, but it's important that we don't get too fixated on those. They're important, they, they will get acknowledged. What is it that we're trying to achieve as a collective here? And once we bring it back to our why and almost a daily reset and refocus is what I sometimes have to do that I'm not otherwise, I fulfill that stereotypical angry black woman and I don't want to do that. Sometimes, yes, I am angry, I'm allowed to be angry. These things make me angry, but it's just acknowledging that we are gonna be sensitive, it's normal. It's absolutely normal, but just remembering not to take our eyes off the bigger picture. Fantastic. Brilliant. Thank you so much. And, and thank you to, to all our panelists for their, their wonderful presentations and, and discussions. And I think, um, unfortunately, Nikita had to, to leave us to, to join another webinar. Um, but I mean, between us, um, I'm sure we've got more than enough experience and uh, inspiration uh, to answer a lot of the questions that have come in. Um, so one of the first questions I want to actually ask is going back to, um, to Dr. Shahid Morali. Um, so we've got a question here um, in view of what you said earlier, um, how do we pragmatically change the status quo in primary care? Um, and then a second question that really tags onto that, um, as a fellow working on differential attainment, I think talking about the exams, so differential attainment in the exams, um, it's clear that there are barriers to progression in, in any career faced by doctors of an ethnic origin. Um, and that becomes evident very early on in training. How do we encourage quite early on the inclusion the networking, the opportunities that are key to achieving a leadership role. I'm I'm keen for um, the stress, similar to what Mayur said, that we should harness all these opportunities. We 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 do have the playing field, and we can level it. And I'm I'm keen to stress that it's important to strive to identify and find those opportunities to get involved wherever possible. And sometimes there's a barrier. And we've identified those barriers, but it's important to get to get past that. When on, for your first question about about these different things, I I really think we should be carefully calling out these things, whether it's at a board meeting or it's at anything. We should be calling out these microaggressions. I'll give you subtle examples. It makes me angry, like what Margaret said. Why is it that the the patient 
in an OSCE who is getting angry and testing the communication skills of a medical student because of their hypertensive medication. Why is it that in that case, they were of Afro-Caribbean descent? Why is that in the other OSCE station, the, the, the Asian patient is a taxi driver? Why? And I'm, it's important that we identify these and call them out. And in the same way, then I will use influence that I have and I call upon all. I love that statement Margaret made. Yeah, there's, there's loads of us here. You know, I made sure that when we put in the budget request for some extra mannequins to train clinical skills, they were of different skin tones. And make sure that we are there representing these things everywhere, calling out those microaggressions, macroaggressions, whatever you call them, and making sure that we represent that and actually inspire and motivate others. This is this is communal. If if I see people, um, participants finding it difficult to 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 um, in, in embody that leadership within their own selves, I see that as my own personal failure, because I see it as my role to help and support and nurture those other people to do so. Fantastic, thank you so much. Um, a question for, for all the panelists. So um, how do you juggle uh, home life uh, and work uh, in your leadership roles, especially with family responsibilities? I know there are lots of, um, I've had lots of anonymous private messages from uh, attendees that are single mums or single dads that um, have one or more, more than one child who are trying to aspire to leadership roles, but also have quite significant home commitments and then obviously we have uh, attendees and, and doctors that are carers as well how do they, do they balance that so if we start with um uh with mayo margaret benga then victoria then shahid yeah so can i say i think you know this concept of work-life balance i want us to think about that right is that a realistic option right can you have your cake and eat it. Yeah, we've chosen professions and a pathway that actually, you know, uh, are stressful. Okay. So I think it's something around um, uh, being uh, reasonable and being practical about the choices you make. So it's Victoria, what Victoria said, choices right? What are the choices that you're making? And what are the implications? Okay, it also links with my point earlier. And I'm sorry, this sounds really hard. But this thing about entitlement. And, you know, can you have it all? So if you choose to have a high pressured national role, then you've chosen that. Yeah. And you can get a call at 11 a.m., 11 p.m., 11 a.m. then on a weekend. And that's something you have to choose. Now, that doesn't mean that we don't have boundaries. So I think it is about choices uh, that you do make. But I do think this idea of a structure is really important. You know, the CERL structure, C-E-R-L, clinical component, you see, as a leader, I feel you have a lot of credibility if you're a clinician. As soon as you stop being a clinician, that doesn't mean you don't have credibility, but it's a different credibility. And leadership can make you choose or drive you into two directions. One is where leadership is your main role and the clinical role is a side issue. Whereas what I've chosen is that the clinical role is your main day job, your day job, and then you're a leader as well. Now, can I say it's not always easy to reconcile those two, but it's an important consideration. So talk to your practice, talk to your family. You know what? It's about resilience. One thing I would say I'd like to end on, it can be done, right? Don't be fooled by this illusion that oh, I, you know, I, I can compartmentalize things and, you know, it's going to be fine, right? Leadership is a privilege. If you want to change something, right, you have to devote your energy and time to it. And by being clever and by being resilient and find out what that means, right, 
you can have an impact. It's all about impact. So I, like I said, it's be careful about entitlement and about cynicism and why you want to get into leadership. So if you make those choices, I think you can still put boundaries in and still make a difference. Fantastic. And I'm going to bring that on to Margaret, but I'm also cognizant of the time and I know you need to step away. So there's one question I really wanted to ask you, uh, and then I will bring it back to the work-life balance with Margaret and, and move around the panel. And that was, uh, there's two questions. So firstly, what are the most important decisions that you've had to make as a leader? Let's take the presidency of the RCGP as an example. Um, what would you feel is the most important decision you've had to make? Um, and what, because you've, you've been in the game of leadership for a very long time, what are the common um, behaviours or traits that you've seen that either derail or propel new leaders? Okay. Well, if I take the second one first, right, is uh, when people say, oh, we're already doing that, right? You don't need to do that. Or we've, we've got this covered. For example, um, uh, communications or membership engagement or... Um, recognizing the difficulties that uh, uh, BAME doctors face or um, many examples like that. So these are standard leadership issues. You know, people say, oh, we don't need to do that because we're already doing that. Yeah. Or the other thing is that um, we've got a plan already. Yeah. Uh, oh, it's, it's, a, it's a communications issue. We've you just don't know about it, you know? And as president, I felt I had to represent the members issues. And can I say, we did do that. I felt we did that, but you know, I'm happy to be, you know, corrected on that. We obviously, with the complex, complex adaptive system with over 50,000 members, you can't get everything right. So, so I, think, I think there's something around priorities and making sure agendas are listened to and heard. Um, and, you know, the issues like, what is the college for? And, and I think in a forum like this, I should raise it. You know, is it for members and for making the lives of members comfortable, like, you know, general practitioners' lives? Or is it about care for patients? I think it's a bit of both. Because to give good care for patients, you need to make sure that the daily working life of GPs is good. So they have access to x-rays, specialists, um, time to care, etc. So, but can I say these are common leadership uh, challenges and very, very important. I think in terms of the most difficult decisions, I think there's two things. As chairman, I had to decide whether, whether there should be a, a system of practice accreditation. Um, and this was a forerunner, I guess, of the CQC registration. Um, I mean, I've reflected a lot on that because I think a professionally led system of quality practice development uh, or QTD as it was called I think would have been fantastic. You know, it's the, it's the model we have for trainer accreditation and practice accreditation for training where you have trainers and educationists visiting each other and approving practices. Um, and I think there's a lot of reflection and learning from that. And maybe if we had that model, we wouldn't have this state regulation. I mean, not that I think, you know, that wasn't necessary at the time, but now it seems to be honestly a very toxic phenomenon. People, you know, are stressed. They're leaving the profession because of CQC regulation. I understand the reasons why it's needed and why it was needed at the time. But now we've assessed every practice in the country. Do we still need that? So the most difficult decision I had to make as chair was, should we have a professionally led system of practice accreditation or should we um, allocate that to the state? Discuss, yeah. So, <laughs> and then the, the other thing was whether MRCGP was, should be the entry standard for the profession. I'm glad to say with my team, uh, we won that battle with the profession and uh, the representatives that actually 
I would say that's one of my proudest achievements around uh, together with end of life care, which we won't have time to get into because people are now identifying people who, who are at risk of dying and care planning. But the idea that you enter a profession by being part of an organization through a independent standards assessment, the MRCGP, I think that is that is good. So I didn't get everything right. You know, at least at leaders and one final thing, you got to learn with difficult things, things that didn't go as well, as well as positive things. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Mayo. Thank you for your for your time as well and for contributing today. Um, Margaret, going back to the sort of work life balance side of things, um, how do you strike a balance? So um, <clears throat> essentially, I think I think it was Maya's slide which talked about timing. So timing is really important. When my kids were much younger, I wasn't as busy. Um, and that's probably because I wanted to be a little bit more present in their lives. Um, as I mentioned, my parents were very busy and not that I was abandoned, an abandoned child or anything, but <laughs> I it was really important to, to be present in their lives. And as they got a bit more older, um, it was easier to take on more leadership roles. Um, but I'd say to anybody out there, because we're very conscious that we've got another whole cohort of new international graduates and we sort of deliver a talk for our fresh cohort every year and my husband actually gives it and he actually talks to families and explains to them that often we get stuck in what I call the hustle mode where you're just trying to get to finish your surgery for six o'clock get to pick the kids and you're, you're constantly going but you know running like a bat out of hell sort of thing and he tries to explain to people that the a lot of people come from backgrounds where they're very well supported. So they've got their families around. They may have a, a maid or a driver, which are the norm for a lot of middle-class families um, in particularly in a lot of West African countries, but that doesn't exist here. And it just makes things a lot, lot harder. So grow your network because you need other people to help support you. And that's really, really important. And just acknowledge that you can't do everything. Um, so that's things that you can do yourself. And in terms of the partnership, um, um, I had a partner the other day because I restructured my trainee's appointment so that she was able to finish at four. And uh, there was a comment, you know, you know, in my day, we we wake up at you know two a.m. And, and I was like, yeah, but that was in your day. This is twenty twenty now, and we that this is not this is not normal <laughs> for us. So, and if you actually want to um, keep and retain people when their kids get a little bit older, like myself. Um, then surely I'm going to commit more to the practice because I have more time. So these things go in circles. So yeah, you know, try and be realistic, but grow your network as well. Fantastic. And and Benga, from coming up, uh, coming to you. Yeah, I think um, I think if you ask my wife, she would say I'm not doing really great. <laughs> <laughs> to that but I think um, luckily we're quite a young family um, it's just three of us me my wife and my one-year-old um, son and um, thankfully during the this period I've been able to to juggle my work so I sort of looked at what areas I'm more passionate about so that's why I sort of reduced my hours in the clinical leadership role I decided to do more sessional roles so I can work around what I'm, the business or the business I'm trying to build and, and thankfully, um, my wife has always been working from home and due to COVID, she's, she's not been back into work. So um, I don't know what it would be like when the family gets bigger. So I think then I would come to ask Margaret and others for advice. Yeah, fantastic. Brilliant. And, and Victoria? Sorry, um, I was unmuting myself. Um, yeah, certainly, uh, I think uh, having um, boundaries is important. Having supporting a supportive networks is very important. But um, at the end of the day, it comes down to choice. Uh, so make sure that you make the choices that are important to you, and that you love what you're doing. Because that, if you if you love what you're doing, you somehow find ways to fit it in um, and uh, also it comes down I think a little bit to having a sense of control sometimes what fr frustrates us when we do different roles especially leadership roles is when we realize we cannot do we cannot achieve what we want to achieve but I think taking things a little a step back and uh, re-evaluating uh, what is under our control 
And the first thing that is under our control is ourselves. So, uh, and our reaction to things. So understanding that. And the second part is uh, to understand what other, from the, from the activities that we undertake, what is under completely our control and trying to do that. And then uh, uh, try to change um, processes and organizations and society, the society with others. So working within teams, understanding that this is not really under completely our control and we need to work with others. I think that makes it better. And let's not try to attempt to change people because I think that's the most difficult thing. Let's not try to change others. We can very much try to change ourselves. But I think the change in others will come through changes in the wider society. Fantastic. And, and Shahid? I, I want to echo what my colleagues have said in that make the choices, make the right choices and prioritize them. And also, you know what, let's all be a little bit easy on ourselves and also be honest that perhaps all of us carry a little bit of guilt of some of the things that we want to be able to do that we can't do. And that's not, I'm not even speaking just amongst pandas. I'm talking about everybody here as participants. So, you know, let's be honest as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shahid. Um, Margaret, um, just a question for you. How how do members from uh, diverse ethnic backgrounds overcome imposter syndrome, improve their self-confidence to find a seat at the table with our peers? Uh, just to apologise, I'm only switching off because my bandwidth is rubbish and my son is on his Xbox, which is not helping. Um, uh, you need to engage, be brave, find a mentor, find someone, if you know, who looks like you, who doesn't look like you, find anyone, you know, the people that have helped me most in my life have not looked like me. And that's the truth. And that perhaps that's because there haven't been people that look like me in, in positions of influence. Um, so you really just need to harness those, those skills of connection. And because it's only through connection, integration, like Benga mentioned, that you're actually going to be able to get people on, on your side and understand your journey. We're doing a lot of work now with the medical school, with the deanery, getting people to understand people's journeys. And that's really important. Um, there's lots of work going on with regard, regard to mentoring and reverse mentoring. So it's just really reaching out and, and don't be afraid. Because often, like I, I said before, people are so focused in on, you know, particularly my, my trainees, I need to get this CSA, I need to, which, which is understandable because they, they know the odds are against them with regards to the statistics the statistics um but use the people that you meet along the way who inspire you to your advantage because we're all we're ready i mean this is it's a movement that's just going to go on and on and on i really do feel the last few months in my lifetime have been very different to what i've experienced in the, in the past fantastic thank you margaret um Kamenka, coming to you um i've got a question here um from uh, an ST3 actually, um, and what she's saying is, is that she's had leadership positions in, in countries and then she's moved having to start again, building the network again, building you know, the contacts again, um, finish, uh, finishing a GP training scheme, moving to another city, having to start from the foundations again. What advice can we give to people, particularly those from uh, a, a diverse ethnic background about um, how to go about starting from scratch again and again and again, um, rebuilding those networks. I think you're just on mute. Uh, if you could unmute yourself, perfect, thank you. I think, I think it's a peculiar um, situation for most um, IMGs um, in, the, in the fact that we, we move from places to, to places. I think um, the social media now does help a lot to keep in touch even if you move from, from place to place. And I, I, I would just encourage you not to give up, to, to keep trying to always start if you have to start again. Um, the experiences you've had from your previous positions would always help you when you're starting again. So you tend to grow faster anyway. Fantastic, thank you. Um, Shahid, um, coming to you, what, what advice do you have to, uh, just touching upon your point, this resonated with lots and lots of our attendees. So um, what advice do you have for, for groups and teams to ensure that they're welcoming to members from, uh, from ethnic backgrounds? Um, so the flip side of, of what you mentioned uh, uh, in terms of your experiences. Yeah, so uh, you mean how, how we as leaders can welcome others yes. and making sure it, that ethnicity doesn't seem to be a barrier. Yeah. I think 
it's tricky. I, I think part of it might well be the, the visibility and, and making sure people feel comfortable to approach in those instances. And, and maybe that's the main thing I can suggest is that I, I encourage everyone to be as visible as possible to, to, to make it so that there's no barriers on either side and, and ethnicity isn't, isn't even something that's thought about in that way. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shai. Um, and there's uh, loads and loads of questions, but there's one final question that, that I'll field myself. There's a question about um, representation from East Asian doctors um, at BAME events. Uh, so that wasn't done on purpose. Uh, we invited a number of colleagues uh, from uh, the East Asian uh, background as well, but unfortunately, uh, all the ones that we invited seem to have um, commitments at much higher levels than, than what I was offering and unfortunately couldn't make it. But definitely, um, given the success of this event, I'm hoping to make a, a second part to this uh, and really um, expand and enhance the panel um, just to get different viewpoints um, included within our discussions. I think they're, they're really um, important. So just to finish off, if I give everyone uh, maybe 30 seconds, one piece of advice for a young you or someone going into leadership uh, for the very first time. Um, so we we'll start with uh, Victoria. Um, 30 seconds, one piece of advice you'd give someone uh, in your position uh, looking at leadership for the first time. Be yourself, uh, stick to your values uh, and um, learn to challenge constructively. Brilliant. And same question for you, Gwenga. My advice would be don't be faced integrate especially if you're new to the environment brilliant margaret margaret if we uh, same same question for you yeah be courageous think about who's going to help you along the way and just learn to grow your network and you'll get there fantastic and shahid finally just do it don't let anything hold you back just shed insecurities and just strive and do it and and you'll do it Brilliant. Such, such moving, fantastic, inspirational words from, from all of you. Um, so thank you, everyone, for, for coming. And, and thank you to, to our panel tonight. Honestly, big, big inspirations in my life as I've been growing up uh, and uh, looking at leadership opportunities and certainly an inspiration for everyone watching and attending. Um, and don't forget, we have our GP forum, which you can access through the Royal College's website, where we can continue to have a conversation there as well. Um, and keep up to date with what the college is up to across the UK. We're really trying to expand uh, the scope of what we can do to try to support our members. Keep an eye on our social media for the hashtag GP is open campaign that celebrates and showcases the outstanding contribution that general practice has made and continues to make through the pandemic. And uh, thank you all for, for joining us. Thank you to our panelists, but in particular, once again, a big thank you to Antoinette and Kimberly uh, from the Royal College uh, Central Office uh, for facilitating and supporting this event. Um, have a great evening all and stay safe. Thank you. Thank you.